Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French. This pandemic is like a high speed train and our projections tell us that we are on target to derail by around the third week of December. That ominous warning from the top health official in Santa Clara County in Northern California, which is one of the many parts of the state and the country that has been put in more restrictions with stay at home orders, even quarantines as COVID continues to spread. We will spend the bulk of this program on the pandemic and also we bring you into our program. I'll tell you about how you can uh, make your voice heard on an interesting debate I think we're going to have tonight. But first, I want to bring you some breaking news coming from our nation's capital. Attorney General Bill Barr has said today that the Justice Department has found no evidence, I repeat, no evidence of widespread fraud that would impact the results of the election. His boss, the president, however, has not got the memo. He continues to spread lies about both fraud and malfeasance, even though these attorneys have not presented a shred of evidence to this point. The president's legal team, led by Rudy Giuliani, released a statement, and now I read a portion of it to you. Quote, with all due respect, I always love when people start with that. With all due respect to the attorney general, there has not been any semblance of a Department of Justice investigation. His opinion appears to be without any knowledge or investigation of the substantial irregularities and evidence of his systemic fraud. I should mention that Giuliani, who has appeared in court on numerous occasions, has not even offered to produce or even offered the threat of fraud having been committed. But again, why let facts get in the way? To the COVID front, as we are closer to the approval of multiple vaccines, we want to make you... A part of my program, as I said before, to discuss your feelings and your concerns vis-a-vis -vis the vaccine. The phone lines are open, and here's our question to you. Should people who choose not to get the vaccine lose certain rights, like taking public transportation, going to a ball game, or even sending their kids to school? Our toll-free numbers are open right now. 888-766-2428. That spells out to 888-RNN-CHAT if you're calling us from the East Coast, East of the Mississippi. For our viewers out West in Texas and California and other folks, it is 855-735-2289. That spells out to 855-RFL-CATX. Please. Do your best here to try and get as many callers into the program to stick to the number from your viewing areas. And also remember, turn down that TV set if you're on hold so we can hear you without the feedback. Now, as always, you can also make your opinion heard to our question online. You can email us to rfl at rnntv.com or you can also reach us via Twitter, our handle, LarryEP13. All right, some big news on the vaccine front today. A CDC panel met today to determine who would get the first shots as they become available, some as soon as maybe even this month. And that panel it is now recommending that once the FDA gives approval for frontline health care workers and nursing home residents to be the first folks to be able to be vaccinated. Also, it is estimated that about 40 million doses will be ready by the end of this calendar year here, this month of December, that means 20 million people will be vaccinated as it requires two doses. Also, just like everything else with this White House politics, it is, of course, playing a big part in how the science plays out. Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, he met with FDA head Dr. Stephen Hahn today. That to discuss progress of the approvals. It comes as President Trump, he's been pushing for it to happen as soon as possible. Dr. Hahn, he released a statement trying to tamp down concerns that the process is being rushed by the West Wing. And I quote now Dr. Hahn, our career scientists have to make the decision and they will take the time that is needed to make the right call on this important decision. And speaking of politics, Dr. Scott Atlas, who I wouldn't trust to work on my dog, he is a radiologist with absolutely no experience in infectious diseases. He's been advising President Trump here. He's just resigned, thank God. He consistently downplayed the virus. He spoke out against basic precautions, like even wearing a mask, and he believed in herd immunity, all debunked theories. And he hadn't even said the spread so much to let people get it here so they'd build up a resistance. This is where nearing 300,000 dead Americans, he now is gone. 
And we are starting to see a lot more of the real experts who have been marginalized in recent months, like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Birx. This has been happening as the numbers continue to be nothing short of astounding. The U.S. is now approaching 14 million cases, including more than 4 million new cases in just the month of November. Plus, nearly 270,000 Americans have lost their lives to COVID. We're still averaging 1,500 fatalities each and every day. Also, close to 100,000 people are now hospitalized with COVID in this country. That is the highest number we have seen since the pandemic began. Many areas, they're starting to set up field hospitals to handle the expected surge, including places in Long Island in New York, two cities in Rhode Island, just to pick a few spots and a multiple spots across the country in that reality. You also have rural hospitals. They're dealing with the most alarming capacity issues, including this one in Oklahoma. Back in April, we just had one hallway um, on the floor that had COVID patients. Uh, now we have four hallways worth of patients with COVID. They're seeing death every day. We're seeing people dying. And, you know, in the past, we have one patient dying a week, two patients dying a week. Now we have four or five dying every day. But big cities also getting hit hard. This doctor in Houston describing what he and his staff are dealing with. I've been working for 256 days today, uh, nonstop, and I don't know what what keeps me going. I don't know how I haven't uh, broken down. As we have discussed before, you know, my nurses have broken down. My nurses cry in the middle of the day because, you know, they get so, so sad sometimes for situations like this, you know, just seeing a patient that's crying because he wants to see his family. Now that a vaccine is on the horizon and it is great news, the next challenge, though, is about distributing it and also getting people to take it. Now, fewer than six in 10 Americans say today they trust COVID vaccines enough to take them. That number, it is up from 50 percent in September, but it is way short of the 70, 75 percent threshold of the population that will need to be vaccinated to eventually stave off the virus. Also, there are some legitimate concerns like side effects, including headaches, fevers, chills and more, albeit at this point. They're of the temporary variety. Take a listen to the head of Operation Warp Speed. Maybe 10, 15 percent of the subjects immunized have quite noticeable side effects that usually last no more than 24, 36 hours and uh, resolve. Most people will, will have much less noticeable uh, uh, side effects. Uh, that, frankly, in comparison to a 95 percent protection against uh, an infection that can be deadly or significantly debilitating, I think is, uh, is an appropriate balance. A trade-off uh, that America should be willing to take, in my opinion. Also, health officials are worried that people won't come back for round two if they don't like how they feel after the first shot. Another concern, that according to one of the top infectious disease experts in the country, is how long the vaccine's protections will last. We don't know how durable the protection is going to be. And, you know, our, for the Pfizer Moderna vaccine, is the protection going to last three months, three years, 30 years? We won't know, but it's okay. Get the vaccine, get those virus neutralizing antibodies in your system. All right. So, with that as a backdrop, um, let's hopefully agree on this much. The faster we can get back to normal in this country is the best thing for all of us. I don't care who you voted for. I don't care where you find yourself on the political spectrum. The last year has stunk. So to get back to normal, we need people to take the vaccine here so we can have some semblance of what America was like again. I want to bring in my first guest, Dorit Rees. She is a professor at UC Hastings College of Law. She's also a member of the Vaccine Working Group when it comes to both ethics and policy. I brought the audience up to speed as to where we are right now, and it's fantastic news about the efficacy of these vaccines. And assuming the logistics are worked out as we hope they will, and I'm assured at least from folks in the front lines that, that we will get there, then we got to get people to take this. And to that point, um, I know you've looked at this um, as to the limits of the law uh, and the practicalities as it relates to also the ethics of it. No one can mandate somebody to take a vaccine. However, 
and there are exceptions that we'll get into. There's a consequence if we don't get at least probably three quarters of this country to take the vaccine, because then we get we don't get to the point we can go back to the way we were. So my question is, from a state and a city level, let's walk through if people choose not to take the vaccine and they don't have a religious exemption, can we deny those folks by not being part of the social compact to get on the train or to board an airplane or to go to a ball game? Are there things both in um, precedent and also protected under law that we can say, if you're not going to get with the program, um, then there are certain things you don't get to do. The answer is yes, we can impose consequences. And remember that there's a difference between what the state can do and what private actors can do. So the state can impose some kinds of consequences. For example, in 2019, when there was a measles outbreak, New York City imposed a fine of $1,000 on people who were not vaccinated in neighborhoods with high rates of measles. But the state can impose some limits as can local governments. Private businesses can say, you want to use our business, you have to meet certain criteria. There are limits on that from anti-discrimination laws, but they can generally say no shoes, no mask, no vaccine certificate, no service as a general matter. The one caveat here is that these vaccines will first be approved by an emergency use authorization. And for that, there's legal unclarity. It's not clear if you can mandate in that sense, a require a vaccine to enter a business or require your employees to get vaccines when it's licensed under an EUA. Let's break this into, um, for my audience, uh, for kids. I have a kid in college. I've got two kids in high school. Um, will their schools be able to say, you don't either get to come back to campus or to walk in your high school door, or for that matter, grammar school, whatever the age group of my audience is, if they're not vaccinated? I mean, that's the rule as it was with measles and, and other challenges we faced before here. Do schools have the basic right to say, as you said, you know, no shoes, no shirt, no service, no shot, no service either? So public schools will have to depend on the legislature to say that. It'll have to go through the democratic process of passing a law. And we'll have to only get there once the vaccine is approved for children, which it's not yet. We haven't started clinical trial of children. But as you're saying, we have a long history of requiring vaccines for school for children. The logic of that is that it protects both the child and the community. And once COVID-19 vaccines are recommended for children, there's no barrier for the legislature to add them. Once they're recommended for children, private school can just go ahead and impose that requirement without waiting for the legislator. Okay, now we get to employers. And I have a, a wife in the medical field, and I know that flu shots were required uh, for, po for folks who walked worked in the medical community before COVID was even in our radar. Um, are there certain jobs where it's not optional? Uh, or is it basically up to any private employer to say, yeah, anybody coming back to the office because we share workspaces um, and I want to be, be able to, you know, have people come in and out of here and feel comfortable about the location that, Either you get a shot or you can't come to the office. Here's the, where there's a real difference between what you can do and what you should do. So legally, any employer can say, here are my work and safety conditions. One of them is you get a vaccine before coming to the office. Again, it's not quite clear if an emergency use authorization limits that. But for vaccines that are licensed, an employer can require them from employees. There's a few exceptions mostly under anti-discrimination law. But generally, employers can set health and safety conditions, and vaccines are an example of that. In theory, yes, an employer can do that. Again, there are some limits. How about getting uh, on a plane or getting uh, on the subway or any public transportation? Because I can argue that we're all put into a common environment I'm not making you get the vaccine, but you can get in your car if you want um, and, you know, take hours longer to get to a certain point. You don't get to put me at risk here simply because you're choosing not to take something that is readily available and deemed at least by medicine and science here as efficacious. So my point is, I know in Europe and I've got relatives, you've got to have a card with you in terms of, you know, an identification. Can we start requiring people that if they want service, not just for transportation, to go to a game, that you got to produce the card here before you 
get on board here or walk through the turnstile? Yes. Implementing it could be a little tricky. So, for example, some countries in Africa required a yellow fever certificate before you can fly into them. There's nothing stopping airlines, private airlines, from requiring vaccination certificate before letting people board. And at least one airline in Australia is already floating that idea. The challenge will be implementing it. What do you do if someone says, I have a medical exception? How do, you, how do people prove that they got the vaccine? Will they have to carry their medical records with them? And do they have to show the medical records around? So it's legally possible in theory, it's hard to implement, and there's a real question, is it a good idea? There's at least an argument that it's so intrusive that it's probably going to be a real limit on people's autonomy. It's going to uh, disincentivize people from using your business if you choose this, especially if other businesses are not. For me, Dorit, I, I've been a huge protector of basically every civil liberty we have, uh, particularly in this country. However, to me, what has struck me throughout this pandemic is the selfishness of people and the lack of any um, concern. Forget about me. How about those poor people on the front lines that are dealing with this and people can't even do the basic minimum of wearing a mask, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry, but there are rights and privileges in this country. Uh, I'm not going to force you, you know, as you said in that story, no one's going to come in your house and pin you down and give you one or two shots here. But you don't get to enjoy certain things if you don't want to participate in a societal compact. Um, does it, I take the stick approach and not the carrot. Why should we reward people um, for not being responsible by enjoying the same privileges that the rest of us are going to do by getting those shots? For a long time, I wrote exactly along those lines of why should we allow people to put other at risks? One of my concerns is that the, one of the things the pandemic did is overturns a lot of people's life for them. People are scared, people are confused. I think people are more vulnerable to misinformation because of that. And with these vaccines, many people don't know how extensive the apparatus is for overseeing their safety. Many people look at them and say they've been rushed. They don't know that there's at least three federal expert committees that are independent, that are overseeing their safety and many systems to do that. So they're scared. The first line of defense against this kind of fear mistrust is not necessarily imposing limits. It's uh, working to teach people what's going on and educate them. I think you're completely right that there's an ethical argument for imposing limits, but I'm also concerned that uh, we don't really have the ability to enforce such wide-scale uh, mandates if the level of mistrust is really so high. And what frightened me almost as much as I always assumed across the pond, um, rational thought would have taken hold more. They're having the same problems. I saw your news poll, the French, it's about one in three uh, that are planning to take the vaccine. So we do not have the monopoly on idiocy, but that's my editorializing. Dorit Reese, thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Um, I have a feeling this is not the last time we'll have this conversation. Thank you again. Thank you. But next, I have the conversation with you. The phone lines are open, and I want to get your take when it comes to the vaccine and whether or not people who choose not to get vaccinated should lose certain rights, like visiting public places, going to movies, public transportation, you know, and if you don't get a vaccinate your kid, should they still be able to go to the same school as the rest of ours? You know the toll-free numbers. You see them right there on the screen. Please, if you call me from the East Coast, use that number. And if you're West Coast, you see the number there with 888-RFL-CATX. All right, everyone, when I come back straight to the phone lines, Andrew and I will go. Your reaction next.